What's up, my wizards? It's Dev, SBNTG. We like it in Magic, and you know what? With each new set that comes out, there are always a bunch of cards that go up under the radar. They miss the hype train for whatever reason, and that's even true this time around with War of the Spark, a set where it feels like pretty much every single card in the set has received a whole bunch of hype, but it was still relatively easy to pick, like 15 cards that I think maybe people aren't talking about enough. Maybe their power level isn't immediately apparent, maybe they have to wait on rotation or for a combo piece to come out or something. A lot of things that constitute a sweeper, and it's no different this time around. So today, my top 15 sleepers in War of the Spark. And don't worry, she can't get the fish, no matter how hard she tries. Now before we jump in here, just quick YouTube reminder, sorry you gotta do it. Make sure that you like the video if you enjoyed the content, subscribe if you want more. Simple as that. But without further ado, let's go ahead and get to number 15 here and kick off the list with Hank the Tank. Now I think Mizium Tank is at least a little bit better than it might look at first glance. This does a few things for the decks that might want it. Spells decks, and even the Is It Artifact decks, you know, the Psy, Sahili sort of Mox Amber deck, just tries to go crazy and make tokens. Well, all the tokens can crew this, and it plays through Sorcery Speed Removal like Kaya's Wrath, even targeted stuff like Lava Coil, this can play through. And even if it does get targeted with a Lightning Strike when it goes into attack, you might be able to throw another spell on the stack and get it out of range, toughness-wise. So there's a lot of cool stuff about this card. It gives it an air of, you know, resiliency that those Artifact decks don't actually have. You know, Science Sahili can make tokens all day. One Kaya's Wrath just absolutely wrecks you. And the Spells decks might want it too, to again have something that's protected from these Wrath effects. Might actually be okay in there too, where all you gotta do is like opt, shot, get down to business, swing for five. You know, it actually doesn't seem too bad in there. It does this interesting little impression of like Juggernaut sometimes, you know. The trample really helps too. There's just a lot of value packed onto the card for three mana. I'm still not sure that it's worth, you know, crowding the three drop slot in the decks that it wants to go in. Again, Sahili Sai. <laughs> I've mentioned that deck a couple of times, but obviously its most important cards are already three drops. How much can it fit this, you know? So, there's some logistic issues with it, but at the same time, the card does an awful lot and might be good depending on how important the sweepers are, and they seem pretty important. Let's get on with it here. My number 14 is Bond of Revival. Now, my first reading of this card is that it's kind of a zombify that forces you to hit your fifth land drop, which actually doesn't seem great, but now that I think about it, it's actually not too bad. It might be the best reanimation spell in Standard, which isn't saying much, you know, but at the same time, this doesn't make you wait as long as the Eldest Reborn. Reanimator decks don't really want that. Usually grindy mid-ranger control decks want the Eldest Reborn. It's not really the reanimator spell that you're looking for most of the time in reanimator animator decks, whereas this, much, much closer to the mark. Usually, though, the big creatures that you want to reanimate, usually you pick from big hasty creatures, right? But I guess with this card, you get a much wider spread of options at like, you know, seven, eight, nine mana in this format that don't naturally have haste. So gifting them haste is actually a really, really big deal in your reanimator deck. And I do think that for the most part, this is better than a card like Rise from the Grave, you know? Losing the ability to target an opponent's graveyard Actually, kind of not that big of a deal, because reanimator decks are set up to reanimate stuff from their own graveyard anyway. So, being able to ramp into this on, say, turn four somehow, and then reanimate Zakama or something, I don't know, <laughs> some giant eight or nine mana thing in this format, actually doesn't look like a bad game plan. I don't think that the card just single-handedly revives reanimator, pun intended, but at the same time, I think it's probably one of the best, if not the single best reanimation spell we have in Standard right now, and that's worth a mention. Now, my number 13 is Spark Double, and this actually sets us off on a little odyssey of the next three cards, all being cards that are being talked about, but aren't being taken seriously. There's a big difference to me between those two things. You know, plenty of people have talked about Spark Double. It's not like there isn't some hype revolving around this card or anything, but for the most part, spiky competitive players that talk about the top tables of Magic aren't really taking this card very seriously whatsoever, and I think that might be a mistake. Just the ability to make double mint twins out of one of your Planeswalkers is good enough for four mana, plus a lot of Planeswalkers are balanced in such a way that their ultimate takes a certain number of turns to get to. Spark Double throws all of that math off and might make you, you know, be able to get to an ultimate a turn sooner, or be able to use a minus ability and still have a ton of loyalty. So, I think that that <laughs> right there is good enough, but this fits into a bunch of decks that want it. It doesn't make Lumbering Battleman a real deck, but it does go in to the Lumbering Battleman deck. Also, the Charmed Stray deck <laughs> wants this card, so a bunch of stupid budget decks want it, but just the ability to copy Planeswalkers effectively, plus get extra loyalty, 
crazy in and of itself, especially with proliferate in the format, that's good. I haven't even talked about putting extra plus one, plus one counters on creatures, or making creatures not legendary, that's fantastic. <laughs> You, know, you can spark double a Shalai, for instance, and suddenly both Shalais have, you know, Hexproof. That's so good. That seems good. Um, so just a lot, a lot to like about this. Not to mention the other janky application with it of playing Davriel on turn three and to spark double your Davriel on turn four, and suddenly you have two rock effects. That's all, all of that is so good. I think spark double has so many cool applications. I don't care if so many of them are jank. I still think the card has a chance at making its mark. But on to number 12, another card that's gotten a lot of talk, but not a whole lot of respect. And that is Bioessence Hydra. I have already gone through all the crazy play lines <laughs> that can be had with a Bioessence Hydra. Plenty of Planeswalkers come down on turn 3 or 4 before your Hydra. And then suddenly when you do get your Hydra on turn 5, or maybe you ramp into it on turn 4, you know, Domri on turn 3, Bioessence Hydra on turn 5, all of, or on, excuse me, on turn 4. All of that seems really crazy, you know, Kiora turn 3, Bioessence on turn 4. These actually seem like not standard defining plays, but plays that are very, very good in the standard environment. You know, it's just huge amounts of pressure on the board. It forces your opponent to have a removal spell right then and there. And even if they can remove Bioessence Hydra, you probably still have a couple of Planeswalkers they have to deal with, if not just the one, you know. So, I like a lot about Hydra. This is one where I definitely think the Timmies might have it right here. Now, number 11, sort of an honorable mention for the top 10 here, is Awakening of Vitsugazi. This is the third card. I told you, we're going to go on a multiple card odyssey of cards that have been talked about but not really given much credence. And I definitely think that this is the best of those cards, you know. When this card was first previewed, there were some people talking about it, got a little bit of buzz. But then, as other things began getting previewed, this card quickly dropped off the radar. And I definitely think that might be a mistake for people to just forget about this. Now, I don't like the fact that this five mana play can be hit by Tyrant Scorn and a bunch of other removal spells, but that being said, this is still a Flash 9-9 you know, for effectively six mana if you want to use it as a combat trick or something, you know, but if you just want to make one of your creature lands a 9-9 at the end of your opponent's turn in your, say, Bant control deck, for instance, this is a great finisher, <laughs> you know. If you've got the board clear after a Settle the Wreckage or a Cleansing Nova or something like that, all you gotta do is awaken a bit too gassy, and suddenly you end the game in just a couple of bites, especially with Shocklands in the format. This is usually gonna end the game in just a couple of hits, so. This actually seems really, really good to me, and like the control finisher that green control decks want, you know. We've seen a lot of action in Esper control, even some action for Jeskai control, but Sultai is still a deck, you know. <laughs> Bant is still a deck, and and those decks did need a really, really good piece that, you know, isn't necessarily a creature. Now, don't get me wrong, Bant already had Teferi, and that's at 5 mana too. So I'm not really sure how much play this ends up seeing in control decks, but it's still a really, really good option to finish the game off. But let's kick off the top 10 here with a few Planeswalkers. My number 10 being Sarkin. Now, this... <laughs> Looks like a joke Planeswalker and has received almost no press other than like what the implications might be in the story. But aside from that, not many people have gabbed much about the actual play applications of Sarkin. Now, I gotta get this out of the way. All you gotta do is like arcane adaptation and suddenly your opponent just can't attack into you because their creatures are gonna die. So that actually seems like a fun way of playing the card, but it's not like dragons isn't a deck. You know, mono red all the way up to Grixis dragons are all decks. Five color dragons is a deck in this format if you want to make it one, but let's just stick to mono red up to Grixis, you know. You've got five drops in that deck that you do want to play, but you might be able to squeeze in a couple of uh, copies of Sarkin, at which point you don't need your arcane adaptation. If you just have a couple of dragons in play, your opponent really can't attack into you because the creature's going to take damage and then get blocked by a dragon. It's just not going to be a good time for them. Plus, Sarkin, if nothing else, can just turn into a dragon and start swinging over. I mean, it's not the best thing for five mana, but versatility is key here. Here, and the fact that he can do that and just be a 5-mana 4-4 four, four flyer is going to be relevant on a lot of boards. Plus the fact that if you got a couple of Planeswalkers laying around, eventually you can just turn all your 
Planeswalkers into dragons swing through. Like, that seems like a good way to finish things off in a Super Friends deck, you know? I got four Planeswalkers out, swing 16 in the air, you know? All, the, all of that is good. So I actually think this fits into more decks than it looks like at first glance. It looks like it's strictly a Dragon's Planeswalker. But it's also Super Friends Planeswalker. Might be a Mono Red Planeswalker after rotation when all is said and done. So we'll have to see with this card. I actually think that there's a lot more to do with it than meets the eye at first glance. But I promised you another Planeswalker. So my number nine is Nahiri. Now, this one, really not getting a whole lot of press for obvious reasons, but I actually think this is a better Planeswalker even without a bunch of equipment in the format. But that is also what it's waiting for, obviously. <laughs> a lot going on in the future for this card, maybe. You know, just decreasing equip costs is a huge deal in the decks that do want that. Plus, the hybrid mana means it can be played in multiple kinds of decks or actually still red cards in the format, like Valduck, that care about equipments. So it could go in mono red Valduck or something. There's just a bunch of things this can do, and aside from that, it just blows away creatures, too. <laughs> Like, you know, the removal ability on a Planeswalker is almost always pretty good. You know, plus she's only four mana to get on board. And I haven't even talked about the first strike. Again, even with, again, without equipments in the format for this to really work off of. Although it does work nice with Helm of the Host on the next turn. I'm just throwing that out there. But even without equipments in the format. This gives all of your guys first strike on your turn, which is a lot better than it might sound to you. That's actually really, really good in combat, giving all your guys first strike. But it can also just blow up creatures. It's a good Planeswalker. Just on basic merit, it's a good Planeswalker. Walker, but if we even get like one or two decent equipments in this format, especially that already have low-ish equip costs that this just makes free or maybe just one, you know, then this is going to be a pretty fire card. So, you know, I'm looking out for this. It's just a really good static effect. That's also removal, like multiple times. It's just, it all seems good to me. So I'm just not sure why this isn't seeing the press. I think it deserves. I guess what I'm saying about Nahiri is that she's rock solid hilarious. But anyway, on to number eight. Living Twister. This card looks awesome to me. You know, it's out of lava coil range, just naturally. Five toughness on a three drop is actually good. Almost always, you know, it's not going to do too much attacking for you or anything, but it's going to hold down the ground, block for you in the early game all game, even all the way up to like Venerated Loxodon, this will block some of the time if it's not getting like a Banalish Marshall boost, but everything else in Mono White, Mono Red, this is going to block really well, so I like the way it holds down the ground, but obviously the abilities are where it's at on this, you know, I like a Land's Edge, Seismic Assault, Molten Vortex, whatever, you know, and I especially like one when we have Crucible of Worlds and the Mending of Dominaria in the format, you know, Wayward Sword Tooth, there's a lot of ways to play extra lands right now, and then play them out of your graveyard. There's just so many different ways right now in Standard to get value out of this card. And although the deck is coming together kind of jankily, I will admit at this point, I'm still excited to play it. And I think that this card is pushed in terms of the stats to CMC ratio just enough to where Wizards might actually want this to be a real deck. It's highly doubtful at this point, but we'll see what we get in the next set. We got one more core set before rotation comes in the fall, and it all really depends on what we see in that set. But even after rotation, even after, say, the Mending of Dominaria and Crucible of Worlds aren't in the format anymore, this might have some attractive options. All depends on what we see in the future, but right now there are plenty of attractive things to play alongside this, and I actually don't think that three mana is too much for what this card actually does. Also can't wait to say let's twist again every time I activate the stupid thing, but anyway. On to number seven, the weird one, Bleeding Edge. I actually have a whole lot of confidence in this card. Now, that said, I'm not 100% sure that this makes Esper decks or Demir decks or anything like day one. It's probably not quite good enough. In limited, this looks like one of the absolute best cards in the set, but can it transcend into standard? Maybe is my answer here, and that's why it's so high up on the list. This is a guaranteed, in most cases, two for one against aggro decks, whether you're playing against mono white or mono red, sometimes even mono blue, even though it puts the creature on the ground. That's not necessarily great, but the token can still block and kill, say, a Merfolk Trickster that's not equipped with a Curious Obsession, <laughs> you know? There are good things this card can do against a lot of aggro decks. Kill something, and then put a creature on board to block for you. That's going to extend the game. Usually it's going to end up, I mean, it's immediately a two for one, but sometimes you can kill two creatures with this one three mana spell. That's going to be huge and this might be 
one of the signals that actually lets us play mid-range in this format, get out of the muck and mire of the aggro control sort of feedback loop, just the, you know, dichotomy that we're in right now. It's kind of boring at times. <laughs> you know, you're either going to play against mono white or mono red, an aggro deck that tries to kill you really fast, or you're going to play a 40-minute game against Esper. You know, <laughs> it's just, I'd really like to get a chance to play all these ridiculous mid-range card, mid cards that we see in this set. Notice how many spells I've given you so far have been like five mana, and all of that is null and void in a format full of decks that try to kill you before you get to five mana, and decks that just counter anything after three mana. So I really hope we get to play all these mid-range decks, and a card like this really, again, gives us a signal against aggro decks. We might be able to do just that, so if nothing else, I think Bleeding Edge might be important for that reason. Now, another card that might be good in a lot of the same situations that Bleeding Edge is, is Widespread Brutality. I have been, you know, talking up this card a little bit so far this spoiler season, but I feel like I'm kind of the only one who has been. Right now, I actually think there's an interesting kind of janky on its face, but maybe better than it looks. Grixis, like, creatureless army deck. <laughs> you know, cute in concept, yes, but might actually be okay. Just a Grixis Amass deck that plays like a control deck, maybe even a tap-out control deck, but still, be, you know, is able to put creatures on the board through the Amass mechanic. Imagine going Bleeding Edge on turn two, or turn three versus aggro, into widespread brutality, get yourself a 4-4, and deal four to everything on board, which is pretty much going to kill everything, <laughs> you know? So, especially against decks like Mono White, that's just a killer turn sequence, but you don't even have to Bleeding Edge first. If you get Widespread Brutality on four, that's going to kill most of Mono White's creatures, you know? Hunted Witnesses, Hunted Witness Tokens, Legion's Landing Tokens, Sky Marcher Aspirins, Dauntless Bodyguards, even the ones that are getting a boost from Revenerated Loxanon or a, ben a Benalish Marshal, not both. But, you know, one or the other. It's still going to kill all the white one drops, most of the white, um, or the blue one drops, all of the red, you know, one and two drops, except for, say, Runaway Steamkin that's gotten big, you know. So there's just a lot of things that Brutality can do for you on turn four. It's not quite a Kai's Wrath, obviously, but it's, in most cases, a Pyroclasm that puts a body on the battlefield. And if you've been able to amass it before then, this card just gets even better. You know, you start dealing three and four damage to everything and getting a big body on the battlefield. Now we're in business. So I actually think this card might be really, really good. And it's just flying under the radar in the face of better sweepers and just more hype cards to talk about. In a set with 36 Planeswalkers, there's bound to be a few really good cards that people just don't pay enough attention to. And I think this might be one of those dire situations where exactly that is happening. This looks like a great sweeper to me, especially if you can support it. But here's the important part. Even if you don't support it, it's still a serviceable sweeper that's going to put a body on the battlefield, even if it doesn't kill everything, that'll block for you. So I like a lot about this card, and I don't think it's getting the due it deserves. We're actually not done with sweepers, it turns out, because number five is Solar Blaze, <laughs> you know? It turns out the Jeskai decks now have, like, four sweepers they can play. That's just off the top of my head. <laughs> you know, they can play Deafening Clarion, Solar Blaze, Cleansing Nova, Settle the Wreckage... <laughs> You know, and especially after Settle the Wreckage rotates out, I think this card might really have a chance to shine. Until so, you know, Settle the Wreckage rotates out, this might still be a really good option for those decks, even above Settle the Wreckage, or as like a 2-2 split or something. Maybe even a 1-1 split if you don't play for Settle the Wreckage in most decks. But anyway, to my point, this kills, again, everything. In Mono White, most creatures in Mono White either have a higher power than they have toughness, or they're at parity. Again, Benalish Marshall, you know, Loxodon, they keep coming up in this video. That's because they're really important cards for a lot of decks to be able to kill. And in most cases, especially post-venerated Loxodon, Deafening Clarion's not going to kill every creature on the board. Even Benalish Marshall in that situation, if it, you know, can vote to cast venerated Loxodon, and it often does. So, I think that Solar Blaze is actually going to be a really important piece for some decks, perhaps Jeskai decks in, in specific. Um, against those mono, you know, mono colored aggro decks, period. Because again, even, you know, the mono blue and mono red decks, those creatures are usually at parity in terms of power toughness. Or say creatures like Vyashina Pyromancer that have a higher power than toughness are still going to die to Solar Blaze. And, you know, mono blue, obviously a lot of their creatures are 1 1s or 2 2s. Even Tempest Gen, as long as they have four islands out, is going to die to a Solar Blaze. So the card actually has a ton of utility against the specific spread of aggro decks that we're seeing right now, and I think it might be worth a shot. And by the way, we also have True Fire Captain in the format if you wanted a janky application. But on to my number four here, we're getting into the thick of things. 
Mobilize District. Now, this is just an obviously good card that, again, I think people were a little bit excited about the day that it got spoiled, and then suddenly the hype train moved on to another station, to a planeswalker or something that people went nuts over, you know? And people have just kind of not forgotten about Mobilized District, but I think people have forgotten how good creature lands in general can be, especially in a format like Standard, because this works in pretty much every deck that's two colors or less. You probably don't want this in any mana base that's trying to fit more colors than that, but in a monocolored deck especially, or even a two-colored deck, this goes really, really well. It's basically an uncounterable creature against control decks that control decks can also utilize, because there's very little opportunity cost to playing this as long as you've got your mana base shored up, you you know, this again is an uncounterable creature against other control decks in the mirror match, which is always nice. And in the very late game, it's a threat that can either block or attack through, sometimes for the win. So there's a lot to like about Mobilized District, even if you don't have legendary creatures or planeswalkers to enable it, you know, make the activation cost cheaper. It's still a fine card, especially in the late game, where you need a way to funnel your mana into a useful purpose. So I like a lot about Mobilized District. I think that in decks that are especially modern colored decks. Um, this is just going to be a really, really important card. And I don't know that it's going to be a scourge in the format, but there are going to be a lot of decks that move to play this. Plus, again, if you want a janky application, which I know you do, you're watching my channel. You know, we're actually seeing a deck come together that's like mostly colorless. We got Ugin, <laughs> Ugin, ugh, we got Ugin in this format, along with another Karn. We already had a good Karn. A bunch of halfway decent artifacts, and now we got the lands to play them. You know, we got Zalfir and Ford, uh, Zalfir and Void. Why do I keep messing up cards names? <laughs> we've got this, we've got uh, Reliquary Tower, we've got, oh my god, there's a bunch, Arch of Araska, Field of, of Ruin, there's just, there's even more that I'm missing here, did I say Emergence Zone, there's just a ton, if you wanted an all colorless lands, mana base, and standard, you could actually put it together, and I'm, I want to be the guy to do it, well we've reached the top three y'all, best sleepers in the set, by my estimation, number three, Roalesque, nobody seems to like this card, <laughs> Unlike some of the other cards on the list that at least received like a day of hype when they were first spoiled, the resounding response from the community to Rolex was like, eh, that's fine, I guess, maybe, it's probably bad. <laughs> I actually have liked this card the whole time since it's been spoiled. Five mana for four, five flying tramples at least on rate, and it's going to bring six power onto the battlefield for what that's worth, and it's kind of worth a lot. For your five mana, you know, six power, four of it flies, four of it also tramples. But then, when it dies, you get to, like, ultimate your planeswalkers, maybe. That seems, that seems really, really good. At the very least, you put extra value, you know, extra loyalty on your planeswalkers. And you make the creature that you made bigger when this came into play a little bit bigger if it's still around, you know. Plus, any other wild growth walkers, merfolk branch walkers, jade light rangers, whatever else you have out that got counters will get more counters. You know, Benthic Biomancer, you're gonna loot, whatever, you know, Incubation Druid, I don't know. There's just, there's lots of ways that you could not quite break this card, but really synergize very well with this card right now. And it's probably at least a one or two of in certain decks. I'm not sure that Soltai wants this or anything. A lot of people's argument is that Hydroid Crisis is a better card, but I'm not sure that that even makes sense as a comparison. They're just both big Simic creatures that you cast in the relative late game, you know. This has a lot less versatility than Crisis, but it does so much at the same time, you know. You get a big body your opponent absolutely must answer, but when they do answer it, you get two more of the power back on the battlefield after this dies, plus you get extra loyalty counters on, whatever, plus if you got any other green creatures with counters on them, they get bigger. There's just so much value in this thing, both entering the battlefield and dying, which are, that's always objectively good to get out of your creatures. So I think Roalesque is just not getting the attention it definitely deserves. This is a really fantastic card, by my estimation, and it might never get its due. Now my number two here is Single Combat. Now this is the highest sweeper on this sleepers list. That's actually tough to say. I nailed it first time <laughs> in any event. I actually think that this is a really, really unique effect that we have not seen very often. It might actually be a lot better than it looks. Now, you don't technically get to respond first or play your spells first or anything, but you do get to put your shields back up first. You get to untap and stuff, you know, and then you can counter spells and whatnot. You can play instants and sorceries and all that before your opponent can actually 
actually begin, you know, rebuilding their board, which is really, really nice. A lot of the times, you'll just play a sweeper and your opponent will be able to immediately reestablish their board in some way or another. They can't do that with this, you know, you say go, they can't play creatures and stuff, and then you get to go untap put your shields back up and say go yeah they don't they, they mean they get to play stuff now but again you get to counter spells <laughs> and absorb is back online or whatever so this just looks phenomenal in that way for control decks i think there are probably better sweepers for them to play although this is a little bit easier to cast than kaya's wrath even given the fact that it happens a turn later and kind of you know leaves stuff behind i'm not sure how much i like that either there are things that i don't like about this a la like tragic arrogance really reminds me of that card but the fact that it allows a control deck to get its shields back up before the opponent actually does anything could actually be really, really insane. So I've got my eye on this. But number one, my number one most, I guess, underappreciated, not paid attention to card in the set is Commence the Endgame. Now, this is another card that I feel like got a little bit of press, like the first day it was spoiled and we all moved on from it, you know? But this is just, like, way better than, say, Mold Drifter, for instance. You know, it costs a mana extra. But, at the same time, it's going to get you a huge creature in control decks at instant speed and its card advantage all on a stick. So you can play this as a combat trick to remove a creature if that's what you're trying to do. Or you can play it at the end of your opponent's turn as kind of a finisher, you know, draw two and then suddenly put a 5-5 five, five on the battlefield at instant speed. The instant speed is the real trick to this card and what I think makes it playable. But, even if you're only playing like a one or two of in your control deck, again, I think that the instant speed is why it's in your control deck to begin with. The fact that once you do establish control of the game, you can really knock the opponent out. They get one creature out and they want to attack with it, suddenly commence the end game, plops a big creature into play, draws you a couple of cards, and kills their guy, and it's just this like three for one, <laughs> you know, it's just ridiculous value all on one card. And although the price tag is relatively high at six mana, I think it's almost certainly worth a one or two of in most control decks in the format. Drawing a couple of cards is no joke. That's exactly where you want to be at this point in the game at instant speed. And obviously putting a giant body on the battlefield, you know, most control decks are going to be able to get at least a four, four, if not a six, six or more out of this card when they play it. If you can actually hit the hold a full eight, eight, then you've pretty much, you know, won the game as long as you can keep control. The fact that you can put like a 5-5 five, five on the battlefield, draw two cards, and immediately untap to protect it is just nutso to me. I like this a lot better than options like, say, Dream Eater for control decks. So I just, I think this is great. I think it's a wonderful card, and it's really not getting the attention I think it deserves at this point because I think this could be everywhere in the format a month from now, and it's just not seeing press because of cards like, say, the new Three Man It's a Fairy or even like Dovin's Veto, <laughs> you know, Tyrant Scorn. There's a bunch of control cards that are just seeing a lot more action than this in the Magic Press, and I think that's a shame. Those are all great cards, but this might be one of the cards that really puts things over the top, even for non-Esper control decks. That, ladies and gentlemen, is all I got for this one. Now, if I miss something, don't worry. It might actually be on the top 50 list. I am considering making that a top 60 list, but I'm not that crazy. <laughs> Unless I am. Have I gotten that crazy in my YouTube group? Yes. I think you're just trying to console me, Ziggy. <laughs> At least the top 50 is going to be coming out in the next couple of days here by the weekend's time. So, if I miss something, missed something. Don't worry. One of your favorite cards that you don't think is getting paid enough attention to might actually be on the main list. So, subscribe if you haven't done it yet. Make sure you get that content deck techs coming very soon after that something else you want to subscribe hit the bell for the notifications do all that stuff like this video if you liked it hit the patreon you still got time to vote on what deck you want to see first this season and beyond there's going to be polls all season for what decks you want to see so just throw a dollar into the patreon link in the description vote on what decks you want to see first aside from that hit tcg player if you want to order any of these cards that you saw speculate if you want to i'm not telling you to because that would be a very dumb idea for me to tell you to do that but if you do want to speculate on anything in the set, much less these cards, hit the link in the description, go over to TCG Player, use them as your price guide, order stuff from them because they're going to give you the lowest prices. Aside from that, I think that's about it. Just hit me up in the comments section. Just let me know, you know, how I did, what cards you'd put on the list, if it was your list, and all that stuff. But I guess aside from that, follow me on Twitter at SBNTGDev, and I will catch you cats later. I'm Dev from the place. Thanks for watching, my wizards. Spread love and be kind.